Well, good afternoon, everyone. The beauty about this lecture slot is that everybody falls asleep or gets up for lunch. So, uh, uh, what you can see on this title slide is actually um, an LED, which is a fairly modest powered LED, but it's being seen through a lens. And it's 10 kilometers away, but, but you can't miss it, can you? Uh, it's a bit bright. But we'll see later on uh, what some of them look like at much longer distances than this. I thought it's perhaps just useful to just remind you of uh, what we're talking about here. Now, the frequencies we're talking about here are so high and the bandwidths are so wide that it's useless to think in terms of frequency. And so it's, at optics, we normally talk in terms of wavelengths. And the wavelengths here for visible light, which is what we're mainly talking about this afternoon, are, are hundreds of nanometers, basically. So green light, which is where our eyes are most sensitive, is about 550. And red light, which is where most of our, our systems work, is about 600, 650 nanometers. Um, you might say, well, why, why do we use red light rather than green? And it's partly because of the properties of the atmosphere, um, because we have to take into account things like visibility. It's, it's a bit not, not quite the same as microwaves. Really. So uh, what we've got here is a picture which is essentially showing you the transmission coefficient through the atmosphere this way between 0 and 100%. Uh, now, this is assuming there's no rain around that sort of thing, or cloud, or mist, but uh, against um, wavelength of, of the radiation. And um, essentially, this tells us where we ought to be operating. Um, if we're down here, uh, 400 nanometers we're, uh, and below is where we're into the dangerous UV, the stuff that causes cancer and so on, so we don't really want to be down there. And also, by the time we're down here, our eyes are not very sensitive to that. So there's an obvious eye hazard that if you're starting to operate high-power UV sources, A, you can't see them. So that if the thing's turned on and you look at it, you might do a lot of damage to your eyes. So that's probably not a good idea. Um, whereas here, if, if we come up here, run about 600, 700, uh, now, these, these curves are for different elevation angles, so we really ought to be looking towards the horizon. So these curves are probably lower than this for towards the horizon uh, propagation. But we can see that if we come up to, say, uh, 750 nanometers, there's, there's a, a big absorption due to oxygen. And then if we go up further, uh, about 950, which is in fact where TV remote controls work, Again, there's, there's a water vapor, water vapor absorption band. So those are not places you want to use um, for uh, line of sight through the atmosphere and communications. <coughs> so this is another good reason why we're around here. Um, but also, there's a window in there um, where you're up into infrared, um, which is actually quite a good place to be, if you could see it. Um, but there are ways around that. So this is why, why we're around here. Um, I, I still haven't answered the question, why don't we use 550, which is where the eye is most sensitive. Well, uh, normally we operate at night, although you don't have to. Um, but we find actually that because the atmosphere is never really clear, or not very often, um, you, get, you get mist and so on, especially if you operate over cities. And uh, the red light actually goes much better through um, this, this crud in the atmosphere in Greenville. We've, we've done tests with different wavelengths and, and that seems to be the case. So we're really going to talk about around about 600 in, in what comes. Right, well we must start with sources. Um, and I've, got, I've, got a couple, well, I've got one source here and also um, a photodiode detector. So I'm actually going to pass those around. That's why I rushed out of the room. So I'd forgotten to bring them in. Um, we tend to think of LEDs, uh, the stuff that, uh, you know, a, a panel lights, these sorts of things. Um, <coughs> some of those actually can be surprisingly potent, and you might be able to work a few kilometers with those at night. Um, 
these are rather more powerful ones. These are called stars because of the shape of the, the PCB that they're mounted on, the heat sink that they're on. And some of those might be three watts DC power input, so a few hundred milliwatts optical output. But the things that uh, I tend to use these days are these, um, and there's one of those coming round now. You better see the size of it. Um, this is uh, a good source of these has been on eBay um, from TV projection systems. There are three of these. There's a red one, a, a green one, and a blue one. Um, but uh, the, these devices, when you see them, they're not that big, but they're running at two and a half amps per square millimeter DC current. And so heat sinking is quite important because uh, typically you're running these things at at least eight amps standard current. So that's getting them for 20 watts input. Um, and when you're on speech peaks uh, with modulation, you could be up to 16 to 20 amps peak current. So, um, you know, heat sinking is really quite important at this stage, but, but that amount of heat that these generate, because they're only about 15%, 20% at the most efficient, so there's a lot of heat coming off them, but that isn't necessarily a waste. You can put that to use, especially if you operate at night, and I'll explain why later. If I don't, then just not on memory. Um, so these are, these are LEDs, the ones at the top. Uh, this is a a laser pointer, similar to the one I've got here. Um, some of the early work was done with lasers. Uh, people like uh, Alan White at uh, GHLSD and, and that crowd down there used lasers. Um, I know from experience, <coughs> I know from experience, that they're incredibly difficult to aim because the, the beam width is very, very small. Um, and uh, also they're potentially dangerous in terms of eye hazard. So, that they're not, they're not to be recommended, especially nowadays when people don't like you shining lights around the aircraft and things like that. And I do know one or two people who've been um, sort of uh, fingered by a special branch when they've been near airports shining lights. Um, so we tend to use LEDs, and, and there are other reasons why we might want to use those as well in terms of setting up systems. Well, I, th I thought it'd be interesting to just come back to the point I was making about frequency and wavelength earlier. Uh, and I'm, I'm lucky enough to have a couple of uh, computer-driven spectrometers, um, which are based on diffraction gratings and, and charge-coupled device detectors. And what I did was I, I, I measured the, the frequency spectrum of, of one of these laser pointers and um, a fairly medium power um, LED. And the scale down here is in nanometers. And uh, so this laser pointer looks as though it has a, a if you saw that on the spectrum analyzer at microwave frequencies, you'd say, oh, that's not bad. You know, it's a nice, a stable sort of source that we've got here. Well, I'm forgetting about phase noise and things. But, but if you actually look at this, the resolving power of, this, of the spectrometers is one nanometer. Now, one nanometer, a change of one nanometer at these frequencies is probably a bandwidth of a, 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 a thousand gigahertz or something. It's incredibly big. So these are by no means narrowband sources. And, and if you look at the standard <coughs> LED, you can see that the, the, the width of the curve here is very, very much brighter. So within that, you could probably transmit all the bandwidth that you require in the world at some instant in time. You know, it, it's probably <coughs> thousands of, uh, of, of gigahertz bandwidth there. It's incredibly wide. So we're not too worried, really, about um, you know, narrowband and wideband in, in that sense. Uh, and also, we have to think about the, the way in which we can tap to light. <coughs> so in terms of optical detectors, what can you use? Well, there are various things, and some of them have advantages, some have disadvantages, but phototransistors, uh, pin diodes, which are the ones, these are the things we normally use as our detectors. Uh, LEDs, the LEDs themselves can act as optical detectors. Um, and so you can actually make a transceiver by just using one LED. And you can use it on transmit, you can use it on the team. And you can do clever tricks with them on the scene to, to improve the, in quotes, noise figure. 
however many hundreds of dBs it might be. Um, also, another possibility is, is avalanche photodiodes, and, and these are very expensive, though. Um, you're talking about $1,000 a shot, that sort of amount. Uh, you can buy much cheaper ones, which have been used in, in cameras, electronic cameras. Um, but the size of the um, detector element is very, very small, and that has limitations then in terms of the optics of the rest of the, of the design, which I'll come on to in a while. So we'll, we'll stick really with the pinpoints. <coughs> now, um, photodiodes, of course, are not narrow band detectors. They will um, more or less detect literally from DC to light. And what I've done here is to show the typical silicon photodiode response curve with wavelength. And I've just shown up here the four particular areas which might be of interest to us. So if we were operating just on the edge of the UV band, about 400, you can buy LEDs here on, on eBay. I think they're really sold for um, helping cannabis plants to grow, but they don't need to say so. <laughs> but, but they do, you know, you can get quite a lot of output power at, at 400 nanometers, but they are dangerous, so not something you really want to use. Um, a lot of LEDs are around about just over 600. That one that's going around now is about 625, something like that. Um, I mentioned earlier about um, a window in the infrared band, so you can buy infrared LEDs at quite high powers. And uh, an infrared system actually works better than a, a red light system in terms of penetrating the atmospheric muck, as it were. And then up here, which is where the peak of the response curve is, um, is, is where the TV remotes are. But if you try that outside, you'll find that uh, it, the atmosphere isn't, isn't very transparent there, as we showed earlier. So that's the place actually to be avoided, even though it looks quite nice in terms of the detector sensitivity. Um, if you want to work down at UV, although uh, silicon photodiodes work reasonably well, um, you can fall back on the <coughs> old photomultiplier tubes, which people used to use years and years ago. And I'll show you an example of it, a piece of gear that does use one of those later. Now, um, let's talk about uh, antennas. Um, well, we use lenses in our case, but the same rules apply that the bigger, you know, the bigger the aperture of the antenna, the more gain it has and the narrower the beam width. Uh, and that's fairly true for optics as well. Um, now, if you think about lenses, then you tend to think about, you know, lumps of glass with nice smooth curves on them. But in fact, uh, you can make these a lot lighter by using a so-called Fresnel lens. And the most common example of those is, is if you ever go into a lighthouse and you go up into the, the place where the light actually is, and you look at the chunks of glass that are there surrounding the light, that is actually a Fresnel lens. It's essentially a stepped lens. So uh, every time the, uh, the thickness of the lens increases by a wavelength or a few uh, whole numbers of wavelengths, you can chop that piece away and step it back, and that will still act as a, as a good lens. And the lenses that we tend to use are uh, things like this, and again, I'll pass this around. It's, it's an A4 size page magnifier. Uh, and at one time, the one of the remainder shops um, was selling these at 99p a throw. And um, you see, the aim is not necessarily to use a lens to give you a high quality image, which you would have in a, in a camera. All you're interested in is gathering the light. You're not worried about forming a beautiful, sharp image at the focal point of the lens. The lens is just there to collect enough light and dump it on the surface of a photodiode. And because the, the size of a photodiode is several millimeters squared typically, as long as you can get all the light dumped down in that area, you don't care about the quality of the images, as long as the light gets there. And so you can, you can get away with things like this, which are less than perfect lenses. Because obviously the, the steps that you get here uh, you get effects which degrade, if, if you use it as a camera image, uh, sorry, camera lens, it would degrade the image because you get diffraction, scattering, and all sorts of things. But here we don't give a damn about that. We just want the light. 
If we just look very crudely at receiver optics, uh, basically we have a lens as big as possible to, to pull in as much light as possible. And we want to bring it down roughly to a focal point where the photodiode is. But we find that we can never actually, with this type of lens, we can never actually produce a very sharp spot image at that point because of the imperfections in the lens. And you end up with what's called a spot diameter, sorry, a blur spot diameter, which is typically D over a thousand, something like that for phenol lenses. <coughs> so, you know, we, we're talking about a blur spot diameter of a two or three millimeters at best, and, and sometimes it might be a lot worse than that, depending on the lens quality. So that's all we need, basically. Um, transmit side <coughs> is a bit more difficult, because if we're using LEDs, so if we've got an LED here, and we've got a Fresnel lens here, um, now F over D is, the, is like you have in camera lenses, it's the ratio of the focal length to the diameter of the lens. Um, F over D equals 1 is, it seems to be about optimum for the sort of systems that we're playing with here. Um, but you see here that if this is the uh, radiation pattern of the LED, then you can see that a lot of the light spills over from that and never goes through the Fresnel lens, so it never gets transmitted into a type B. It's wasted, basically. So we need to think about how we can improve that radiation pattern, if you want to think of it in those terms. Well, if you, if you look into this, you find that if you buy sort of what I might term proper LEDs, high power LEDs, um, then uh, assuming you're not buying them from eBay, if you're buying them from a reputable manufacturer, often they will be able to supply what's known as a ray file. And what they've done is they've taken an LED in a special rig um, and they move it around in all possible directions in front of a detector and they record for every possible set of angles the light which reaches the detector. So essentially it's, it's like a, a 3D radiation pattern. And what they do then is they do some processing on that data and they translate that into a set of rays of light which are coming out in well-defined directions in, in, in all possible angles and the intensity of the light in those directions and you end up then with a, a so-called ray file and um, these may have anything between a hundred thousand and millions of, of uh, hypothetical rays of light coming off the surface of the LED and what you can do is you can then write uh, an optical uh, tracing program and you can follow how each of these individual rays of light pass through an optical system. And in our case at the moment, we, we've just got an LED at the, the focus of that lens that's coming around. And then we want to see how much of the light actually passes through that lens and how much is wasted because they're not used. So I wrote some software to try and do things like this. And uh, here's an example of um, a, a golden dragon stick in the make of, of the, uh, reasonable power uh, LEDs <laughs> and I'm looking at five million rays of light in all possible directions coming off the surface of the LED and I'm then seeing how many of them actually will pass through the area of the lens. So each of those dots you can see on there represents something like 50 rays of light <coughs> and what I did was count up the number of rays of light that were actually emitted, I know it's five million, how many actually passed inside the area of the lens? And it was about 13%. So that obviously means an awful lot of the light is wasted, which is bad news. Isn't it? So what can we do about that? Well, what you can do is that you can have your LED, which is just there, and you can put in front of that a secondary lens, um, which is of this particular peculiar shape. So it's... Um, it's a sort of bullseye type lens. It's got very sharp curvature um, on both the outer and the inner surfaces. And the idea of that is that effectively it, it bends the rays of light which will be coming out up here somewhere. It bends them in so that um, they will actually pass through the, the area of the lens. 
Um, the only penalty you pay with that is that um, when you do the ray tracing, you end up with a virtual image of this LED, which means that the actual beam of light that comes out here is wider than it should be. But that doesn't matter. In fact, that's beneficial in some ways. So if we do that experiment again, <coughs> we've got the same LED, the same 5 million rays of light we're tracing through the optical system. <coughs> so we've now got this peculiar shaped lens just in front of the LED. And then we can see now that this is the light output. We can see that a lot more of it actually gets through that lens. So we've improved, if you like, the EPRP, basically, of, of, of the system. So you can spend hours playing with it, things like this. But I also did this practically in the sense I set up a little lab, as it were, in the lounge, and turned all the lights out and everything. And I set one of these up, and then I, I um, uh, photographed it with the camera, and then I, I processed the image and drew contours of light, light contours across the surface of the image, and I looked <coughs> to see what it was like. I did a whole series of tests like that, and, and, and uh, it confirmed the, the optical ray tracing I've done. Right, so let's turn really more to sort of uh, how we put this stuff together. Um, this is a very simple system. All systems are wideband. Um, it's all really DC. It's no, there's no sort of RF stuff here. Um, so if we've got an LED, uh, obviously we might want to put some bias on that, bias current. And then we can have an audio amplifier. And then we're just feeding that into here. This is amplitude modulation basically, or if you want to send CW, you can have a, uh, a 555 to give you a square wave and you can just key that. Or you can send day trim, and we've done that as well. On the receive side, you've got basically a crystal set and, and an audio amplifier on the end. So it's extremely simple um, to do. Right, so putting a system together, um, the person who is guiding me most is a guy called Clint Turner in the States. KA7OEI. I should say that at the end of the talk, I've got some um, sheets which give you lists of interesting websites and things, sources of information. So if you want one of those, then Derek has some of that. Um, my transmitters use these uh, flat lights uh, about five watts out, I reckon. They're very, very bright. Uh, they look just like a searchlight beam, red searchlight beam, which comes out. If you want to see what one actually looks like in practice, I've got some videos which I might show later on in the afternoon if anybody's interested to see them in action. Um, but you certainly wouldn't want to look up one of these. You, you definitely get eye damage if you, if you did it. But because you can see this beam of light coming out, it makes aiming of this in a particular direction very easy because you just move it around until the beam's pointing in the right direction. Um, as I said, the receiver, basically a photodiode, audio amplifier, uh, in my system, I tend to use separate transmit and receive, so I've got two of these A4 page magnifiers, so that the, the system is quite big, um, but that's good. Uh, solid construction, tripod, and also a telescopic side with, with crosshairs is quite good, <coughs> uh, especially if you're looking for somebody from the other end, um, because sometimes the things aren't quite as bright as that first picture you saw. Right, so I'm just going to show you a few pictures of the gear. Um, so that's that's the receiver back end, that's the transmitter back end, basically that's the modulator. And I'll show you the circuits and so on involved with these in a minute. The telescopic site on the top, that's just a, a Morse key on the top. And because uh, where I live is high up and windy, then you need to be to... <coughs> That's the front of the system, you can't see a lot from that, apart from the fact that you can see there are two of these phenomena lenses. If you look inside that big box, uh, on the left-hand side we've got the transmitter. <coughs> so behind this, well, sorry, on, on this heat sink, which is a computer heat sink with a fan on the back, um, there's one of the, these LEDs that's going round. <coughs> and then this is the secondary optics. So the, um, the Fresnel lens is sort of further down to the bottom of the picture. And then on the right-hand side, this is the receiver preamplifier. I'll show you the circuit <coughs> in a minute. And then on the front of this, um, there's an infrared filter plus a red um, piece of um, uh, filter and material, again, photographic. And a useful um, source of this stuff is that 
uh, reputable uh, photo shops, camera shops, will sell you a little book of samples of filter material. <laughs> and they have maybe one to two hundred samples in. And each, so they're all different colours of the rainbow. And each one normally has a sheet of paper with it, stapled on it as well, showing you the response curve of the filters. So, so it's easy to, to see which colours you, you actually might want for the particular system that you're using. And uh, th these, these books of filter papers, uh, very cheap, like you just pay for the postage basically, maybe a pound or so. But there's enough uh, material on these to make quite a few filters. Uh, rather than buying, you know, a huge, great sheets of filter material. Um, I, I was talking about heat sinking. This, this is another system. Um, this is an earlier one. But this is only a three watt device mounted on a heat sink. And then I've just got the uh, secondary optics there, which is just held in a pipe clip. So it's a bit crude, but it works. Um, I said that these devices produce quite a lot of heat as well as light. <coughs> And if you're operating on a, on a hilltop somewhere in the winter, um, you tend to find that the, the lenses and so on get covered in dew. But here, of course, you've got a lot of heat coming out of this, and you've got a fan on the system, and so it blows warm air around the enclosure, and so it keeps the lenses clear of dew. So it's, so it's sort of you know, recycling energy, as it were. Right, this is a, a, a typical amplitude modulator. Um, there's nothing very special about these, so just a speech amplifier, um, quite a big beefy FET shoved in there. There's the LED, and uh, this is basically just a feedback loop to set the current, the standing current for the LED. Um, and uh, because this bit runs on 12 volts, this bit runs on just over 5 volts typically, because um, there's nothing in the circuit which actually drops the <coughs> voltage. That's just a sensing resistor for the feedback loop. And so I normally um, have a, a, um, one of these uh, down, down converter, voltage down converter thingies, these switch mode power supply modules. <coughs> so that produces about 16 to 20 amps at 5 volts. And they're so efficient that they don't lose much power in terms of heat. But uh, otherwise, if you're running everything off 12 volts, you've got to have a whacking great big resistor in there, which will drop 7 volts at 5 amps, or, or 20 amps. And that's an awful lot of heat loss. So it's better to start with the low voltage at that point. Um, you can feed in data as well. And we've fed in things like uh, SSTV at, at this point in the system, and it, and it works very well. So this is amplitude modulation, as it stands there. Um, that's what it looks like inside the modulator. Notice the high frequency construction technique there. Uh, that's the current sensing resistor. It's only one ohm, but it's got a lot of current going through it. So nothing very special. Um, this is a receiver front end. So the important part is here's the photodiode. It's actually reverse biased, and that's to um, reduce the diode capacitance, so that increases the bandwidth a bit. Um, the, the, the frequency response of these systems drops off very rapidly, um, even at sort of high audio frequencies, and so we try and put some reverse bias on this. Um, and also there's a, a, differenti a differentiator circuit here which gives you 6 dB per octave boost at the high frequency end. Um, there's just a constant current source there. And the most important thing is that the, the gate of the FET there uh, ha has to be in air. The connection has to be in air. You can't just point it on the circuit board. <coughs> it's got to literally be stuck up in the air. And that's to make sure there's no leakage at that point, electrical leakage. Um, that's what the back end of the receiver looks like. It's got three bits in. Um, at one stage, I had an audible S meter. In other words, as the signal strength increased, then the, the uh, pitch of the tone increased, but I found it a bit useless, and so I gave up on that. Much more important is that um, if, if you operate over cities, and, and unfortunately we have to do that in this country often, um, then you get, you get interference from street lights, and um, it's typically like uh, harmonics of 50 hertz, so you get, you get 300 hertz is 
is a very typical sort of hum you hear in the background. Um, so that's a three-phase supply, and of course with lighting, you, you know, you get twice twice the uh, cycle in the, in well, the AC vehicle. LED street light. <coughs> Sorry? So the LED street lights. Have you noticed Well, we, we've just been converted to LED street lights, and I must admit I haven't listened to any yet, and I'm dreading what I'm going to hear. <laughs> but, but this, for the more conventional lights, is very, very effective in, in taking out a little crud. It really is, but again, it was it was Clint who developed that, um, and I had some uh, collaboration with him on that. Um, if you want to test your receiver, then uh, it would be nice to have some test gear. Now, of course, there isn't test gear, at least not the sort of stuff that we can buy. And so, what I wanted to do was to build up a system which is rather similar to what you would use for measuring the noise figure of, of an R, you know, a, a microwave receiver. So you want a noise source that you can switch on and off, and you, you measure effectively the signal to noise. <coughs> um, you know when the, when the thing's on, when it's off, and that you, and you can work out what the noise figure is. Now to do that, you obviously you need a calibrating noise source. We don't have calibrating noise sources, but all I'm all I'm doing is using an Arduino to switch an LED, a small LED, on and off, and that is mounted at one end of a long piece of drain pipe. Now this is very short here just for the purposes of illustration but typically that's two or three meters long and so there's the noise source LED at one end and my receiver front end is at the other end and um, you have to do things like um, make sure that the ends are light proof there and there and you also have to line the inside of that tube with black flock paper which doesn't have any reflections, so you don't get wall reflections, because that upsets your, your, your results quite a lot. Um, there were two ways I was doing this. One, I was, I, I was literally getting the Arduino to measure the receiver output uh, when the noise source was on and when it was off, uh, and I can adjust the brightness of, of this, in other words, the current going through this to adjust the brightness of the LED. So as your receiver gets better, you can, you can crank down effectively the noise level. Uh, and then I had a second version of this where um, I just had this on all the time, and then I looked at the signal from the receiver and through it transformed it to look. Um, I, I wanted to look at the, the frequency spectrum of the signal coming out from the receiver. And then I could, I could look at the noise level well away from the received signal because I was modulating the um, the noise source at, in this case, about 70 hertz. And so on, on the frequency display from the receiver, I, I get a spike at 970 hertz. And a bit away from that, I just have the background noise. So if, if I take the FFT and I take the appropriate contributions to where the 970 is, and then I look at some of the contributions well away from that, which is the background noise, then I can get signals and noise from that. In the, uh, and that, and that seemed to work well. Because it, this thing is not calibrated, I can only get comparative measurements. So that would tell me whether, you know, what I've done to the receiver is getting better or worse. But, it, but it's quite useful to be able to do that. Um, if you want to test out in the field, this was a system I set up at one stage. I've got an optical sensor in there. Uh, and then I've got a piece of board with these uh, reflectors, the sort of things you put on the back of trailers and things like this. And then I had a long piece of cable which went from the optical sensor back to where I was, which might be 100 meters or more away, and I had a little <coughs> box on top of the receiver which measured that voltage from the optical sensor. So I could then adjust the focusing of, of my uh, LED with respect to the, um, the Fresnel lens and so on. Um, so it was a sort of distant um, signal sensor. Um, path planning, well you can use the same um, tools as you use at, at microwave frequencies. The only difference is that our k-factor for our optics is not 1.333, it's about 1.17. And that's because if you look at the formula for the refractive index, uh, there it's different at microwave frequencies and optical frequencies. The, the water vapour isn't, isn't very important at optical frequencies. In terms of refraction, it's obviously important in terms of uh, visibility through the atmosphere, but in terms of you know, ray bending, 
on these on these uh, coverage charts um, is, is not important. So it's only the, the um, gases that, that uh, are important. Uh, making an optical contact, well, pointing is quite important because some of these systems, systems are very narrow beam, especially if you use lasers. Um, it's virtually impossible. Uh, rifle scope is good, or, or a good pair of binoculars. Uh, if the target at the far end is visible, then <coughs> if you're using one of these LEDs with a wide beam, you just go zonk and you're there. Um, so you don't even need this. And there have been times when uh, we've used this sort of thing for lining up like 47 gigs systems. Um, you do get atmospheric scintillation, which you would expect, because if you go out at night and look across the city or something, you've got hot air rising, you can see the street lights appear to twinkle. That's, that's, that's atmospheric scintillation. And you can hear it. Can you just knock the lights down for a second? <coughs> yes. Lighting control. Yes. What's it say? Minimum lighting control. All right. The only reason I wanted the lights down is because you may not be able to, you may not be able to see this otherwise. But this is um, shooting across Sheffield at night, and this is an 87-kilometer path. Now, notice the QRM. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether you can actually see it, but the light is just there. Uh, you probably can't see it. It was only just visible, um, and you really needed binoculars to spot it. You couldn't see it with the naked eye almost. I mean, this is obviously a camera shot, so it's integrated the light a bit. But uh, that just shows you what you may be up against. Is that the one to the left, Barry? You should have got the right one. Sorry? <laughs> no, there is a light right over there. That isn't it. This is another problem, because the more... Um, wind farms that get put up, the more red lights that you see around the place. And um, the last time that I used my gear was on uh, uh, November the 5th. <laughs> and, and we were actually trying to do a 47G test over about 80K. And we actually had to use uh, red light to set it up to, to work out which direction you're going. But there were so many red lights all over the place from wind farms and fireworks going up and you can actually hear the fireworks on this, <laughs> surprisingly <laughs> enough. <laughs> Sorry, it's great fun. Can you just mark off here? Thank you. <clears throat> um, optical records. Now, um, it's surprising how far you can actually work, but I'll draw your attention to this. In 1894, the US Army used flashing mirrors, heliographs, somewhere in, in the desert, I guess in Arizona or somewhere like that. And they achieved a contact, or passed the message, 293 kilometers. No one has done that yet with amateur optic, optical systems. Um, when lasers were first invented, the, the, um, the uh, helium neon lasers, um, there's a couple of people in the States who used one to work 189K, 1963. The, the, the actual world record, really, for a two-way contact is, is, is Clint Turner's group. 278k. Now he lives in the States. He can drive up 5,000 foot mountains. The atmosphere is totally clear because it's dry. Now you think of the atmosphere in this country. <laughs> so if you look at what's been done here, it is quite modest. We, we know there are paths longer than that which will go, but it's finding the day when it's sufficiently clear that it will work. That's the big problem. Um, now, having done stuff at night, and we thought it was rather easy eventually to do that, because we worked out how to do it, we then thought we'd start trying to do some in daytime. And we set ourselves some very stringent rules, and that was that it had to be done within a, a midday plus or minus one hour, when the source of QRM was at its most intense, i.e. the sun. Um, but we did cheat a bit, because we only looked at uh, east-west paths across the country. <laughs> And of course, we knew the sun would be due south at that time. And so that helped a bit with reducing the QRM. But um, we've only managed 83K so far. And the thing was that I could see on that particular day, it's quite a clear day, I could see where the person at the other end was through binoculars. I could not see the red light. 
And that's even with you know, one of these high power lights. But I can actually see, it was like a, a, a sort of a bit of high ground with a hedge running along the top of it, and it had a gap in it where he was. I could see where that gap was at this distance of binoculars, but I could not see his light. And it took something like over two hours to actually make a contact. Um, it was just because the, the light level was so high from the sun that, that the noise level was way, way up. Um, but it's quite a challenge to do it in daylight, but it's good fun. Um, I thought I'd just say, add a few. How are we doing? Just give me another five minutes. Um, I, it's just one or two other things, sort of top supplementary things I wanted to mention. One is filters, because I, I mentioned earlier that the receiver is quite useful to have a filter across that. Filters are not narrowband things at these frequencies. Um, this is an interference filter, um, and it only works for normal incidents, because if, if you have um, a piece of glass, um, which is of a particular um, thickness, then it only works when the, when the light goes perpendicularly through it. If you have light from your Fresnel lens coming in at an angle, then the frequency, or if you like, the, the, where the, the curve is, it shifts. So it's very difficult to, um, to actually make a very narrow band filter. And so the, the filters tend to be wider like this. Uh, that's a microscope filter, actually, that one. But this is a piece of the photographic film I mentioned earlier. And you can see that's actually just more this is a high pass filter. I think that's a, not really indicative. Um, I mentioned um, photomultiplier tubes, um, 931. This does work at um, UV. The only reason I put this in was because the power supply for the photomultiplier tube was from a, a bug zapper. One of these things that looks like a tennis racket mm. you can buy in the summertime for zapping bugs. And the supply in that is 1,000 volts or more, quite high impedance, but it's enough to drive a 931 uh, tube. Uh, I forget about that, but you can also modulate using pulse width modulation. Um, the variation on that is um, sequential multi-tone hell. Uh, I'm interested in that because um, of doing non-line sight paths like cloud scatter, uh, possibly using infrared. In fact, this is an infrared system. It's uh, supposedly a high power LED array in there with a, with a sort of bullseye lens on the front. And again, you can buy these off uh, eBay for <coughs> helping plants to grow. Um, but that's just, showing, that's just showing the hell received over a short range of there. And this is um, a sheet of information, websites, and so on, which, which um, Derek has kindly uh, done for me. Um, well, thank you for listening. That's just an arty shot my wife took once when I was out testing, so that was my LED and there was the moon up there. And she liked that. Um, what, I, what else I would say is that I, I had got the components here for a simple optical link using um, multi-tone health driver if you want to see it working. And there's some videos I can play if anybody wants to see me showing things in action. Maybe SSTV. It gives an idea of what, what things sound like and what they look like. Thank you. Thank you.